Great. Thanks, Paula. And um, afternoon, everyone. Do appreciate you coming here on what is a slightly chilly and is going to get dark afternoon, isn't it, as we sit here. Um, so I've been invited to talk very briefly about some of the things that are happening in England around adult safeguarding, um, and hopefully that will resonate with the work that you do here and what's going on, um, though, of course, there are, there are different setups. Um, one of the things is the title. Um, adult safeguarding is what in England we've been using now since, um, since really our interest in this area. A little bit of work on elder abuse, but unlike a lot of countries in the world, uh, we don't say elder abuse and, um, um, and the rest of adults, uh, but it's called adult safeguarding, and I think that's pretty much the same here, except I think you more often use the word adult protection, don't you? Is that right? Somebody tell me, is that right? Good. So um, adult protection safeguarding. And I don't know when safeguarding came in and why it came in. Probably in England we use it because we um, have had children's safeguarding for a long while and often what happens in children's services spills over to adult services. But if you replace protection and safeguarding, you'd be on pretty safe ground here. And I'm going to talk about messages from research, but also about other messages that are not from research because this is an area of practice where a lot is happening and sometimes it's built on research quite often it's not. So it's not to say that research has, um, is, ter is that important all the time, or even if you're allowed to say that in a university setting. Whoops. Um, hey, let me see. What do I have to do here? All right. No? How can I? Oh, there we are. So this is just to say what we're obsessed with in England, which is our CARE Act. And we have two acts that to influence what people do in safeguarding in legal terms. One's the CARE Act, and um, it's 2014. That looks as though we've got lots of CARE Acts, haven't we? But actually in England, we hadn't had any with that. Ra regardless of the CARE Act, it was the Mental Capacity Act that has shaped practice frameworks, shaped thinking, and shaped the evidence base in England. Just to say what we also use, it's a bit of a sort of dictionary bit, this, isn't it? To say that in England, we tend to use the word adults at risk which is sort of a bit odd, isn't it? Because you know, I'm at risk of all sorts of things and you don't know who you mean. And then we have to say adults at risk with care and support needs who are unable to duly protect themselves. <gasps> and then you know, you've know you lost the plot with most people you're talking to. But we just have to say adults at risk like that very quickly nowadays. What that replaced is terms like vulnerable people. So sometimes, of course, people still use the word vulnerable person, vulnerable people. It's in some other forms of legislation, the Gambling Act, uh, things to do with criminal evidence and so. So we, we live with that, this understanding that there are probably much the same groups, sometimes called adults at risk, sometimes called vulnerable people. Um, in England now, local authorities have got um, a responsible, they're the main agency for safeguarding, but they're meant to work with other partners. So in England, we talk about the NHS as though it's separate. Um, we talk about the police, and those are the sort of three main bodies. And then there's a round of other bodies, including the voluntary sector, which is in involved in a lot of safeguarding boards, but also organisations working with um, Department for Work and Pensions, for example, and sometimes housing providers. And I think we're only really getting to grips with how um, matters such as abuse, exploitation and neglect affect people who are homeless, affect people who are under coercion from landlords, those sort of things. So um, there are various partners. We know there's lots of reasons why people need care and support. Um, the problem with public sen sector expenditure in England is it has gone down dramatically. So it's not only people who get care and support, but there's a whole raft of people in England now who should be getting care and support, but they're not eligible for public funds. And so safeguarding does encompass those. There's lots of ways in which people mistreat or neglect, um, ne um, neglect people, and we'll touch on some of those. Some of them are really distressing, and although I'll move quite quickly and hopefully more in art beat way, we do need to acknowledge that this is a distressing area to work in. It's emotionally taxing, and we need to watch how people might get burnt out and inured to um, what's happening. There's lots of debate about safeguarding, how big a problem it is, smaller problem, etc. And we um, try and build on the evidence there. And then what I'm going to be talking about today is really safeguarding relationships um, about some new areas that are happening and the implications for practice. So this is what I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover what has been a really major change in um, English safeguarding practice, which is to use the words making safeguarding personal. And of course, everybody refers to that as MSP, and I'll explain what that's been around. Going to look at some relationships, which are the problem, actually, rather than the solution. And those are relationships where we've got problems with access, or obstruction, or hindering, um, which is a word we've been cre creating. Then we're going to look at system and professional relationships, particularly those that come out through 
um, inquiries and reviews because I think sometimes we focus too much on interper interpersonal relationships and we don't look at those relationships between um, professionals, volunteers, um, you name it and so on. Then we're going to look at what's new relationships, which are online relationships. They're not relationships with people you've ever met, people you've ever talked to, but perhaps people who are contacting you in different ways. And then lastly, back in many ways to where it all started, which is about what is happening around family dynamics and when they go wrong as well. Here's a book which is um, so old that it's a bit blurry there. It's one, one of the earliest books of um, elder abuse or touching on that subject, written by a director of social services. So when you say where was the research and did research create interest in the problem, actually it bubbled up from practice. Adult safeguarding is one of the areas where people in practice really made a difference in saying this is what's going on. So Mervyn Eastman, that is he, um, put a, an appeal out in community care and the social workers in this area audience will know that um, community care used to be a magazine that you got in a little plastic folder. Uh, nowadays you have to get online but um, it still is much the same. He put out an appeal in community care in the 1980s and said has anybody had any, had any experience of something I've been coming across, got quite a few replies and began to develop writing and interest in this area. And that's how it started. So here in this audience, somebody could one day say, I wonder if I'm the only person ever who's come across a case like that and uh, really pick it up and uh, develop some interest in it, because almost certainly you won't be. So he talked about old age abuse. That had its genesis in other areas which they termed granny battering. You hardly ever talk about that now, do you, granny battering? But that's really where it all started. And that was a counterpoint to child battering, which started off um, in being dis as a discovery, as though it hadn't happened before in the 1960s. Moving on to areas of family violence, because a lot of these were cases that he came across in practice involving families, and often with the idea that something called carer stress um, depressed people so much that then the relationship was damaged by the stress that the carer was on, usually a family carer, and the uh, stress relieving was to um, abuse, mistreat, neglect, exploit the person they were looking after. So this is areas of relationships that have still hang around and you often hear care as stress hypothes hypothesised or given as the possible explanation for when things are going wrong, but it isn't always. So let's move on quickly to talk about safeguarding personal, MSP, which sounds a bit like a, a sort of toxic drug, but it's not. It's pretty simple. It um, links with um, the P word in England, which we've been obsessed with for a long time. If you see everything in England now, you have to call it personal, and then it's all right. So person-centred planning, personalisation. Have you, do you have, have a cross, and, uh, is it epidemic here as well? Yes, yes if it's, make it personal. And here's making safeguarding personal, which is in response to some people's concerns that safeguarding was being treated as a sort of treadmill or a process, that people were being safeguarded and then, the, and then there was an investigation and then there was a safeguarding plan and it was all a bit of a, um, an escalator on which you couldn't get on. And regardless of what they wanted, it churned through and there were time limits and you had to do such and such by that day. Here it's a moment really of saying, pause, ask the person or as much as you can ask the person what they want to happen. So it's different from children where you don't say, oh, dear baby, what would you like to happen? Um, you're saying, well, you know, this has happened, let's name it, let's say what's happened, really, what would you want to happen? And of course a person can say what they want. And usually the example given is, uh, there's a family relative stealing from me, I want to keep the relationship, but I don't want them to keep stealing from me. So that's seen as being almost the stereotype of making safeguarding personal. You ask the vulnerable person, what do they want to happen? They say, I want it to stop, but I want the relationship still to happen. And that's a difficult thing for practitioners, isn't it? How are you going to manage that? And we do it by drawing on things like moderating the risks, while supposing the person is taking cash from your handbag, maybe you'll only have a little bit of cash and most of your other things will be, um, will be done electronically or something like that. Maybe the person is taking other things um, from your area and you're going to make sure that they can't be, they're not in plain sight so they can't be stolen and sold or whatever it is. So just being careful about that. Maybe another family member can challenge that in a nice way um, and keep the relationship going. 
Maybe it's not possible to happen anymore, but you and that family member can meet outside the home, whereby the risks are far less. So you can imagine it's really asking people what they want to happen. And that is the magic word that we use ad nauseam nowadays, which is called outcome. Are you very outcome obsessed here? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Then it's all a fashionable term, isn't it? And you even develop your own shorthand for outcome because you have to say it so often. Mine is O slash C because I have to write outcome so many times. Is that what other people use? Um, or um, and some other word like that because I'm fed up with writing it in full nowadays. But outcome is what you want people to say that they would like. What would you like to happen? I'd like my grandson who's stealing from my handbag to still visit me, but I don't want to lose all my money so I can't pay my electric bills. It's talking about involving people in meetings and outcomes. So instead of saying, well, we had a self guided meeting and then we did da 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 da, it's saying, can, you, can they come? Can they make some input? If they can't do that, can an advocate or a representative? So getting their views. It's um, and making use, good use of representatives and advocates. It's also providing people with information. Um, not saying we're going to wave a magic wand and this won't happen again, but here is a way in which you or your family member, using your strengths in your community, can build up so there isn't this large amount of cash lying around your house anymore attracting people. Or we've put a camera in, in front of the door so that people aren't coming um, and using drugs in your living room or whatever the situation is providing people with information. Also writing it down so that you've got a clear evidence trail from when some other professional says, well, I don't know why you didn't do anything. You'd say, well, at the meeting on such and such, we decided that the individual wanted this, that to happen, but they were prepared to put up with this, that and the other. Outcomes, I've said, and um, another part of that has been also thinking about what responses can we make to people um, rather than just saying you're going through safeguarding. So a little bit about developing a menu in being able to say, well, you know, this is a really difficult family setup. What is there around locally that can deal, can help people with complex family dynamics that have been going on for forever and a day? And those might be counselling, it might be going to relate, it might be going to uh, family therapy, or it might be going to um, a priest, it might be whatever it is. So just thinking carefully about what the response would be. So the implications of practice. This has been hugely acceptable to staff. I can't tell you how much people love making safeguarding personal. You could run courses on it all the time, you could have seminars, because people, it makes sense in how people want to work. They want to ask people what to do, even if they're lacking capacity, they want to have a, a sense of what their best interest might be. And if staff think it's acceptable, then I think people put it into practice. It's enabled more experimentation with things like family group conferences, which have been tried um, over the years with many client groups, haven't they? I think I've got somebody working with me who did his PhD in family group conferences. Are they just about to start? And then that's about 20 years ago. They've always been just about to start in England. Do, do they work here? I'm not sure. Do you have family group conferences here? They're just about to start. <laughs> so look out for those. Um, there are loads of literature about them. Um, and for some people, they work quite well. But you do need quite good people to do them and to keep the momentum going. Also, elder mediation or mediation, allowing people to do that. Because nothing's as toxic sometimes as families at war with each other, is there? It makes King Leo look comparatively simple. So um, really working with mediation. So strong support from professionals. Wherever you go, people like MSP and they think it's making a difference to their practice. So that's great, isn't it? Not, not a lot of research on it, but they just believe it is a pos positive practice framework. And um, as an implementation study, that's good really, because usually we always think of implementation as having a law and then people put it into practice and things like that. There is no law about making safeguarding personal. It sort of gets a mention in some guidance of the CARE Act, but it's not a law. What you've done is had professionals saying, we want to work in this way and we think it's effective. Is it effective? Well, who knows and how would you measure it? But actually, if professionals think it works, I think that's really valuable evidence. So, turning to more difficult things, this problem of access, obstruction and hindering. What we don't know, um, and before, um, before or after the Mental Capacity Act, was how many people and in what circumstances 
relatives or other people were stopping professionals from getting to see them, even when they thought there were concerns about them. So you might get something from the neighbours saying, oh, I hear a lot of shouting and I'm a bit worried about this person here. Uh, might get somebody saying, oh, they're, they're coming, um, this person's coming into the shop, a disabled person, and they look always a bit frightened and so on. So concerns, but you turn up in whatever profession you are in, knocking at the door and just saying, can we see? So you've got a, what, what might be called a reason for making the inquiry, but somebody says no. And what do you do? If it's a child, you can probably sort that out, can't you, because you've got legal backing. If it's a dog, you can sort that thing out because it's the RSPCA, who are jolly good at getting into things. But if it's an adult and you don't have any reason to believe that they're lacking mental capacity in the English parlance, what do you do? Um, and we wanted to find out that why, and we've been doing a study on that. First of all, we asked people working in practice, did they have many incidents like that? And quite a few of them said yes, but they had very, very few. And they had, the ones they remembered were very powerful, you know, like when you have a, something like a suicide or a homicide on, on your cases, you remember that. But um, it may be that it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. You do remember it because it is very, very difficult and because the office gets very upset about it and, you know, you don't, everybody thinks it's important. But you've only had that one case, or maybe you've had two or something, whereas had, you've had hundreds of other cases of all different sorts. So we wanted to find out the scale of the problem. What we realised is that there is no way that anybody's collecting any material about it, so we just don't know. We could sort of sit on the doorstep of every social services office, every nursing, um, community nursing team, and say, have you had any cases? But we can't do that. There are few cases. So that's a big area. Should people have the power to go in when it's actually very rarely going to be needed? They're memorable, resource-intensive cases, but maybe there are very few of them. It's risky to have intervention powers. We know that in England, one of the things governments don't want to do is to um, have, be accused of being, you know, um, jackbooting their way into people's private homes, making um, allegations where they're not proven and so on. And of course, in this situation, you will be damned if you do and damned if you don't, really. If you go in and people say, oh, you broke the door down, etc., it will be awful. If you don't go in um, e and something happens, it equally will be but there aren't many cases where that apparently happens. We thought we'd be able to draw on Scotland's experience because they do have a law which enables them, enables social workers and go through the courts with the police to get um, adult protection orders. What we've discovered is that there is very, very little data from Scotland now. Um, we haven't been able to find recent data and that data that there is, is the very exceptional cases. So you have a massive law um, with a lot of politicking around rights and responsibilities and then you don't have many cases. So is that good or not? And of course, does the reason you have, don't have many cases because people say, if you don't let me in, I'm off to court. So hard to tell, isn't it? What we want to do is divide uh, the UK um, down the middle and have a randomised control trial in one area or not, but that's probably not legal, so um, we can't do that. But just to listen out and to listen, because then we talked to practitioners and we found out that in many areas they had worked their way around these complications. So in some areas they sat and they told us about their procedure for doing welfare visits with the police. And we looked it up and thought, welfare visit, where is all this about from? And this was custom and practice, in which they and the police worked very effectively. You go to another area, same legal jurisdiction, and people say, welfare visits, no, we don't do those anymore. So what is it that makes those relationships between agencies mean that in one area you can say to the police, I'm really, really worried about so-and-so? And it could be the police, it could be anybody else in uniform. Fire brigade people are really good to get, in, to get them going around to places. Um, but it could be somebody in uniform. And in one area that works very well and it's sort of a charm offensive. Um, in some areas people say, oh, well, we can't get in, but uh, there's a CPN who can always get in through locked doors. You know, I don't know, we don't know how they do it, but that's the person who everybody knows can get into places. What do people do and how do they make those decisions? We think it's to do with experience that they know which is the person to do. We think it's to do with good relationships, 
and about that sort of embedding of good relationships between agencies. And you may think, well, oh, I've been to this meeting and I've done something very tedious, uh, but actually that is cementing good relationships. And it's particularly the role of managers. It's the managers who do that. So every time your manager is off in a meeting, remember that that is managerial capital that hopefully as a team you can draw on. So, obstructive carers. Some of them are very <coughs> obstructive. Um, and that is, we have some cases now where we know that the relatives said, we are going to court to make sure you don't get in. We're going to complain to our local politicians that you're harassing me. We're going to make a complaint to the ombudsman, etc., etc., just because they didn't want anybody to get through. We know that pulling together practice wisdom is good, so talking about such cases in supervision is very helpful. Um, we want support for practitioners, because, and I suppose from your organisations, that if they have to go to law, then they, your, you as the frontline worker will be backed up by that. So that requires you to do good, good, um, good recording. Limited research on situations where um, this happens, and surprisingly enough, limited research on situations where people haven't got mental capacity and people want to get in. So we don't really know too much about that very difficult threshold boundary and the relationships that often get broken if you tread rather heavily in that area. So practice implications of that. We would say that it's probably a good idea to collect data. If you are coming across increasingly numbers of cases where you can't get in but you have concerns, then it's important to get that, get some sense of how much a problem that is. Is it one case every century or ten cases every year? Is that what's happening? Talking about sharing good practice, those areas where things aren't written down but everybody knows how to get a welfare visit, how do you communicate that on to the new people? Being clear about the risks of action and inaction. The risk of doing this is that we will destroy the relationship that we have been trying to get. Inaction, the risk is something awful could be happening. Having good evidence to provide to lawyers. So saying, make it quite clear from the records that you tried, you knocked at the door, you did this, you left a note so that the lawyers can use it if they do have to go to court um, on some other matter as good evidence. And then thinking round our new law, which is around coercion and control, is what we're seeing here really about coercion of people. Because it doesn't just only apply to people getting in through the door, it also applies to whether or not you can have a private interview with somebody. So you might get in, but um, the person in the caring role or the relative won't let you speak in private to the person and appears to be on, on their shoulder almost all the time. What do you do around that? So interesting points there. S moving on, systems and professional relationship. We've been having a very dull life reading serious case reviews and safeguarding adult reviews, which are reviews of where things went wrong. Uh, either the person died or they were at risk of great harm, so on, and it looked as though safeguarding wasn't working well. The relationships that have been particularly interesting for me have been relationships in these three areas. First of all, our lack of understanding about the worlds of people we call self-funders. Is that what you call them? Good. People who pay for their own care. And we know that there are large care homes where everybody's a self-funder and probably a social worker hardly ever goes in or indeed um, they're running their own show, they've got their nurses, the doctors or whatever. Largely a, a world in which there are not too many professionals working in mainstream services going in, quite self-sufficient. A lack of oversight. Maybe their money is dealt with by the Court of Protection, which happens in England, um, or solicitors, or distant relatives, or whatever. Um, but n not many people having an idea of what's happening in this area. We also found, of course, that most reviews talk to the very variable relationships between, in England, the mainly commercial care sector and the NHS that almost the NHS stopped at the door of many care homes and they were expected to take on things. And that appeared to be a curious relationship. And then lastly, almost every report says that there's a need for more communication and coordination, but I've never read a report of anything that ever said no, more communication or less communication is needed. Uh, but it makes you think how you do it. And the magic one that we often talk about is the, the presence of the fax machine. Right, hands up anybody in this area, in this room, who's got a fax machine in their office. Nobody. 
Right. In England, fax machines are the prerogative of the health service. You can spot somebody who works for health if they know what a fax machine is. Um, and, the, and faxes are sent between the members of the NHS. You don't do that anymore, do you? No. No. Hmm? Yeah, well, in England, they fax things. So if you say, if they say, well, I faxed the care home, the care home hasn't got a fax machine, social services haven't got a fax machine, but they strongly believe that people have fax machines. And indeed, that is how you operate. <laughs> and you know, nobody under the age of about 30 could operate a fax machine anyway, could in this room, could they? Or there's probably one in the, the Museum of Historical Objects um, is a fax machine. So this then, when we talk about communication in this rather global sense, good communication is needed, blah, blah, blah. Just think, you know, are we dealing with some people who have metaphorical fax machines? What is the communication route that, that we have? I went to a care home once and um, they were very concerned that everybody was communicating about things. And we, I said, where were the care plans? And the care plans were all carefully locked up in a cupboard, um, no, in a filing cabinet in the manager's office. So who was going to look at those? Well, actually, nobody, because the owner manager had the key and they lived 60 miles away from that care home and they were the only person who could access those care plans. So clearly, it wasn't happening. Um, so the communication, it wasn't the things weren't there. It was just simply impossible to look at care plans in there. That was a very strange care home, um, which um, technology, that was a little bit limited, but it's the only care home I've ever been to where in the bedroom, one of the people had a, a, a railway track with a model railway going around the picture rail around his room. I thought that was so lovely that who cared about the care plans if you had your model railway? <laughs> this, was, this was wonderful. Um, so there are winners and losers in those things. Practice implications. <laughs> Values of discussion then. Thinking about um, you know, how, how do we make these uh, things happen in terms of um, just moving on. Continuing professional development isn't, shouldn't really be people like me talking to people. It should be about problem solving um, and about talking about cases. And I think in strange in adult safeguarding that we don't talk too much in very, you know, in real terms about what are we going to do with cases. And I think that's terribly helpful to, to do. And we've been doing it a little bit more in England with something called signs of safety, which in children's services, has that come here yet? Yes, yeah, there's, it's all over England, like a rash that at the moment, but um, it's very important. And that has enabled people to talk, I think, a lot more about cases and to actually say what are the dangers, what are the level of the dangers that, or, or, or the risks that they think are happening. So, um, and I suspect that that will move a bit into adult safeguarding, really being quite clear about what we mean when we say risks to well-being or something general like that. We've learned in England the importance of being multi-agency, but the difficulty of being multi-agency when very large amounts of social care for adults in the UK are in the private sector, which has 25,000 registered providers, hugely different to communicate with them all, and some of them are going out of business, into business, and so on. Um, we need particularly to do more work on quality assurance. Um, we've talked about safeguarding, we've done lots of um, you know, awareness raising, but probably we need now to say how can we assure ourselves through cases and um, managers and politicians and so on that safeguarding makes a difference so that people can be confident that what they're doing is right. And then learning lessons from reviews, having done a review which costs an arm and a leg in terms of person time, um, it's important to make sure that the recommendations are smart so they're, um, what is it, measurable, achievable, or uh, timely and so on. If something is recommending that society is nicer, that's no point of the recommendation, is it? But if somebody is recommending that an audit is done of such and such, that is achievable, and that's important too. So, virtual and online, you'll be familiar with that. Everybody knows we'll have a case example, probably from their own family, of people who's pressed the wrong button um, for a bank that doesn't exist or um, anything like that. Um, we used to think that safeguarding was about relationships of trust with people you knew. People don't know people, but they are being groomed and exploited and scammed and so on. And we think probably that people with them, so people are being targeted because they've got um, no money or they have got some money or they haven't got many social contacts or just because the whole population is perhaps at risk. It's part of financial abuse. 
but maybe it's also about trust and so on like that. Um, challenges, so that's the challenge it is, that you didn't actually trust that person. It wasn't like they were your home carer or anything like that, or your niece or so on. It's about um, this new way of the world working it. So, first point is, we spent all our lives trying to encourage people to use IT, but probably we never told them about how bad with some of the risks that were being around. I don't think anybody ever told me when I was starting to learn how to plug a computer in the room, in the wall, which was, took me a long time to work out, that actually I might be at risk. I only learned, you know, about things like um, a bank sending me an email and asking me to do something when I thought, well, I don't have an account with that bank. You know, what's going on here? Um, so I don't think that if people like us weren't told of the risks, then almost certainly everybody um, with health and social care needs probably wasn't either. And they've been encouraged to become silver surfers, whatever ghastly phrase that is um, there. So what are we going to do about that? We can't roll, ba roll back um, the history, but we can say the next time something comes in that appears to be the answer to everything, technology or so and so, let's think about the risks. So in, the UK, in England, we've been rather obsessed with Pepper. Has anybody come across Pepper? Pepper is a robot that is going to solve all our care problems by, um, by being able to do everything and, not, and nothing. So, okay, Pepper, you're going to do, um, you're going to talk to me, show me old photos, whatever it is. What are the risks around that? And everybody's obsessed with Pepper at the moment about how that's going to be the answer to all our prayers. Um, but perhaps, what are the risks of this? First of all, I'm going to trip over this wretched thing, aren't I, for a start? <laughs> and then its batteries are going to run out or whatever it works on. And then maybe it's um, linked up to something and it's got my fingerprints or whatever like that. Um, or, or who knows what it is. But we must be more cautious about IT, I think, in this area. Because if safeguarding, we don't want to be the doom, oh, it'll all end in tears, you know. Those robots will take over the world. Um, you know, it's not like that. But it's we must learn from what happened in scamming and things that not everything is overwhelmingly positive. Um, the role of communities really important there. You and I can go to places and say, "Don't do it. Don't be careful of that." We go, "Ba ba ba ba." You would say that. But the most important thing is when somebody of that age group or the what group stands up and says, "It happened to me." and you know, then people take it on. So um, I've used to, I'm so old, I can remember when people were going around saying to old people, don't keep your money under the mattress. Anybody remember that? Don't keep your money under the mattress. <laughs> Hmm? Still do, still do. Very wise. Nobody ever said that when the banks were closing, did they? No, all those people who had the money on the mattress were very smug. Um, so don't keep your money up the mattress. You could say that, but n nobody was going to take any different notice, apart from the person who would say, I'm 89 year old and I had my money under the mattress, and the, that's the first place the burglars looked. So there was, and then they all told each other where they kept their money, which wasn't under the mattress. I think under the budgie cage, budgie cage um, um, tray was a, a good one that you really wouldn't want to lift that up. But me, freezer. freezer, yes. <laughs> so um, it's just really having thinking about communities and how communities have got to be involved in safeguarding because as professionals we just sound officious and um, you know um, and unrealistic if we go around saying oh it'll all end in tears. So and the other thing is about people who've been so scared by all these these messages that they're unable to use IT at all and that is not that nowadays we can probably cope with that but soon they're not going to be able to claim their benefits they're not going to be able to do this they're not going to be able to get a license not be able to get a bus pass or so on and um, so we've got to think about how systems will work for those individuals so the implications of practice remembering the indicators of financial abuse about why people are in debt in hardship and so on, and just po having some sense of curiosity about why somebody is in that situation when the rest of their peers aren't there. So you go to a, a sheltered housing complex and somebody has really got massive debt. What's that about and where is that coming from? Being aware of false friends and grooming, and we know that some of the learning disability um, charities have been very uh, sensitive to that area that you want people to have friends, but you must be aware of false friends and how you manage that dilemma. Screening for volunteers through um, our disclosure and barring service, which you have here, don't you, um, is always a, a drag, isn't it? If you run, you're in the voluntary sector, you think, oh, I'd love you to come and we'll be here next Tuesday, but we've got to do the forms and so on like that. Um, it probably, there isn't an evidence base to say it works tremendously because it probably screens people out. 
but by and large, I, my sense is that it has made a difference, particularly in employment. Um, relationships with trading standards, they know a lot. You know, we're amateurs in this compared with our colleagues in trading standards. They know how real professionals work. And this isn't just amateur stuff. This is huge industrial um, targeting nowadays. And I think we must listen to them because they, they're switched on in that way. And lastly, as I mentioned, the power of peer advice, which is always helpful. So family dynamics, just to end up really cheerful before you all go home and um, do think of your own family. We know that um, some situations are very vulnerable and that there is precariousness of some families and ideas about coercion have bubbled up, I think, through domestic violence. In adult safeguarding, we've always run on pretty parallel tracks with our colleagues working in domestic violence. We know about them, and they know about us, and we've generally said, oh, well, we'll, we'll think about some of the crossovers. Here, really, I think, in coercion, is the domestic violence group thinking and helping us think about that power of what we used to call emotional abuse. And it was always very hard to think what emotional abuse was, wasn't it? Particularly in, if you're working with very old people, because people say, oh, emotional abuse is shouting. Well, of course, people do shout, don't they? Um, I have a friend who's an inspector, and she said she went into a home and somebody was shouting at somebody. She thought, oh, I must write that down. That's really awful. And she realised the person was saying, where did you leave your hearing aid? <laughs> and because that's what the, the place was. But coercion, that subtle form of coercion, the family pressures, the idea about you're going to leave it to me anyway, it's my inheritance, and so on and so forth, um, and the pressure on people to work there. So we're just thinking nowadays, having gone and said, oh, you must, must, must have lasting power of attorney and appoint your proxies, there are perhaps some people who are saying, actually, I don't think I'm going to appoint a proxy. I think I'll leave it to um, the Court of Protection. And they may be doing it because they fear the coercion. So we must listen. Not everybody wants to plan, and for good reason. All of these are very invisible, quite invisible pressures, often dating back decades. They're not around. Um, people are, people's fear may not be manifest by the fear that we sometimes have learned around in child protection, how people physically and, and developmentally, their fear will be captured. It's quite difficult. And so if you're a delayed transfer of care, which is our English term, people start talking about detox. Have you ever come across people talking about detox? That's the new thing about somebody being a delayed transfer of care. It's the posh word for bed blocker. That's what they really mean. Um, so bed blockers. Perhaps people are frightened of going home or frightened of going back to where it is. If you only see them as a detox, you're not going to get to grips with some of those um, ways in which hospital can be a place of safety for people. The confidence and capacity of helping professionals is, um, diff is um, are not always great. People find it hard to talk about relatives and friends for whom um, they may have be suspicion that family dynamics are not all they could be. And of course, there's a potential for us to sometimes think that people are self-neglecting when actually they're being neglected, um, and that may be hard to tease out. And our new phrase that we used in a report recently was something called cuckooing, which everybody liked because they sort of liked the imagery of it, even if they didn't think it was a nice thing to do. And that's where older, uh, where somebody has got, say, a valuable out asset, like a London um, social housing flat, and lo and behold, the relatives come, and all of a sudden then the person might be persuaded to move on, or then the person doesn't come back from hospital, and they're sitting around occupying it then. Can be relatives, can also be friends, so-called carers, you name it, um, that notion of cuckooing. And when you say cuckooing, um, quite a lot of professionals begin to nod their heads. Not because they've got a cuckooing ometer or anything like that, but because they've seen it, they haven't had a way to record it, but because in practice they've seen that happen, that a very, very substantial resource, like a, a house or a, a flat or something, somebody else has has begun to get their way in. And we know it's, um, it's very hard to negotiate, isn't it? Because you can't prove that pressure and everybody's terribly pleased that there's a carer there and so on and so forth. So we think of that um, and files. So the practice. Is it safe to ask about all this? Our domestic violence colleagues have taught, taught us and have explained that it is important to ask if it's not a risk to people to ask them, but to ensure that things are privacy. Our colleagues in midwifery have told us this is, you know, this is the opportunity to ask, but you must ask in private um, and, and do so. 
framing the question in the way that, again, our colleagues in domestic violence services have said, uh, don't say, are you being abused, but just say, well, some people in these circumstances sometimes find. So you've, you've framed it that it's not um, terribly confessional and validating it. Yes, I understand what you're saying, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to do this with this information. Assessing this, taking action, and recording it as well, even if it's only a suspicion. Um, we find, of course, in England that terms like perpetrator are very hard to use because nobody's quite sure who's, who's doing what, um, but we don't have the language sometimes for those terms um, and they're sometimes unhelpful, but just being clear then when you record. And then again, using those local resources or also pointing out if they don't exist. If there is no mediation service in your town that will take on vulnerable adults, they'll only deal with other forms of mediation, then maybe that should be addressed further up in commissioning or family group conferences or finding out whether relate are so overwhelmed with crisis that they only do this with families with children or maybe they've got room and capacity to do more and counselling knowing what the local waiting list is for counselling what the systems are, are for getting that and therapy and so on so we're using resources so is it safe to ask asking yourself that ask framing the question um, doing assessments all those sort of things I've repeated on this slide. Right, so con concluding points then. What we've done then is covered new points about relationships. It used to be that dyad, um, which is a fine term you only use in professional settings, isn't it? People can work out triads, so they, you can work, use dyads. But it used to be just the one thing, isn't it? I'm having a bad relationship with my mum or my partner or so on. Now we've got new relationships. And importantly, we've talked about professional and systems relationships, not just the dyad. We've talked about, what well, we haven't talked about, but I think these are really useful, is go back to sometimes first practice and think about when did I last use an eco map? People familiar with eco maps? I find that people know them and then they've forgotten them. And they go, oh, yes, I could have used that. Oh, yes. And genograms. People familiar with genograms? Which is like a family tree. People love doing family trees, um, but somehow or other we've forgotten to use them. And I think it's revitalising those because it doesn't half help you um, in terms of practice to know who Mrs M is and what Fred is and all, all that sort of things like that. So revitalising those. We, I pointed to the importance of recording, which I do think is really useful to do. And it isn't just managing that bit about hearsay sometimes, but really recording your concerns, what you're concerned about. Talking about supervision to talk about things like problems of access and so on. Um, having a local map of services and resources and trends, um, really important as well. And um, then if you want other resources more on national, um, you've got Sky here, haven't you? Social Care Institute for Excellence. We use that because it often has got the reports which don't transfer into um, articles or anything like that. It's a great place for reports. And Journal of Adult Protection, I think, really has very, been very useful in pulling together quite a lot of practice accounts sometimes research, sometimes just useful descriptions. So I'm going to say thank you very much for listening and um, I thank you all the study participants that have drawn on from that and the funders and obviously everything I say is my responsibility and not any of the funders, but they probably think the same applies both ways. So thank you.